Our scripture reading this morning is from Mark um, uh, and um, from uh, chapter 12, verses 18 through 32, and we read from the Message Bible. Some Sadducees, the party that denies any possibility of resurrection, came up and asked, Teacher, Moses wrote that if a man dies and leaves a wife but no child, his brother is obligated to marry the widow and have children. Well, once there were seven brothers. The first took a wife, and he died childless. The second married her. He died, but still no child. The same with the third. All seven took their turn, but no child. Finally, the wife died. When they are raised at the resurrection, whose wife is she? All seven were her husband. And Jesus said, you are way off base. And here's why. One, you don't know what God said. Two, you don't know how God works. After the dead are raised up, we're past the marriage business. As it is with angels now, all our ecstasies and intimacies then will be with God. And regarding the dead, whether or not they're raised, don't you ever read the Bible? How God at the bush said to Moses, I am, not was, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. The living God is God of the living, not the dead. You're way, way off base. Then one of the religion scholars came up, hearing the lively exchanges of question and answer and seeing how sharp Jesus was in his answers, he put in his question, what is the most important of all the commandments? And Jesus said, the first in importance is, listen Israel, the Lord your God is one. So love the Lord God with all your passion and prayer and intelligence and energy. And here is the second, love others as well as you love yourself. There is no commandment that ranks with these. And the religion scholar said, a wonderful answer, teacher, so clear cut and accurate that God is one and there is no other and loving him with all passion and intelligence and energy and loving others as well as you love yourself. Why, that's better than all offerings and sacrifices put together. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We are preaching this month about texts that we have to remember when we're in a political season, specifically this political season. And you'll notice the text that we chose this morning is Mark 12. Mark 12 and the interactions between Jesus and the religious folk. God help us for religious folk. Religious folk can uh, sometimes mess stuff up. And okay, they mess stuff up a lot of times, let's face it. Uh, religious people are people who have a certain way of thinking, because it's one thing to believe you're right. It's another thing, it is on. It is on. It is on. Uh, let me just use the other mic. Let me use the other mic. Uh, I just love technology. Okay, religious folks are those folks who believe, it's one thing to believe that you're right. It's another thing to believe that God told you you were right. And when you believe that God told you you're right, there's a certain uh, rigidity that happens. And, it's nor, it, and not only is it a rigidity of thought and a rigidity of movement, it's you begin to tell other folk what they should do and say, if you don't do what I say do, not only are you wrong, but something's gonna happen to you. Now, maybe those of you who are here can hear that in the present political dialogue. When people want to control the lives of other people based upon faith, and whenever I say this, being a religious person myself and being a pastor myself, they say, but pastor, isn't it your job to tell people how to live their life? And Bonnie, the answer is, did you not read the Bible just like in this text? Y'all have replaced what is a relationship with God and what is the revelation of one's own soul and what's on what, what is in the Bible from what we think and our culture and tradition.
Now the revolution, there's a lot more I want to say, but I want to jump to the end at this point. The, the, the idea of this fight was happening between the Pharisees and Sadducees. I do have to say this, that if you are someone who now is in America or now is in the world and now believe that you can tell people what to do and everybody must believe like you, you are a Sadducees and a Pharisees and you're the ones that Jesus was fighting against. You're the one that Jesus looked at and said, yo, y'all ain't getting this thing. I mean, literally, it's not that there's something wrong with you. It's that you somehow have replaced the revelation of God with the revelation of your own needs and desire. And so, therefore, there's this back and forth, and Jesus tells folks. Now, here's the interesting thing in the translation. We read the Message Bible because it's kind of cute, it's kind of good, and it helps people who have not read a whole lot of Scripture understand it. But in this thing, it's really important. Because it says, in the last verse, it says, what is the greatest commandment? And the greatest commandment is that you love each one another and that you love someone as yourself. But there's this word that is translated in the message as other. You know what is translated in most Bible translations as neighbor? Because you see, the other, how you regard your other tells you exactly what the content of your faith is. The other, I, it, it, I, I love sometimes, we in California, sometimes we, we get to the idea that we think we're better than everyone else. Oh, we, we have evolved around. No, we haven't evolved. Everyone has their own prejudices. Everybody has their own desires. Everybody has their own comfort level. We all have an other. Just look at me like I don't know what you're talking about. Just look at me like, oh, no, I just, I love everybody. <laughs> no, you don't. Okay, there's some folk who get on your last note. There's some folks who you are absolutely afraid of before you even see them. There's some folk that make you uncomfortable. And when those folks come into your audience, they are the other. The question is not whether you consider them the other, but what you're going to do about them and how do you regard them. God, I love Jesus. Jesus does not ask us to become something more than human. Jesus asks us to become what is the best of our humanity. And the best of our humanity is to look at someone who's different, to live in our, perhaps our discomfort with them, and call them neighbor. Now, what is one important thing is if you see the word neighbor translated in the Hebrew scriptures, I got to act like I go to seminary. So every once in a while, I got to, you know, talk about, you know, don't worry, I'll get back to being practical. But, but in, in, the, in the Hebrew scriptures, the word neighbor is always translated, meaning, except for, I think, five instances, it's always translated as other Jews. In other words, the notion of neighbor in the, in, in, in the Hebrew scripture is always the notion of people who are like me because I consider them a neighbor. Then here comes Jesus who comes and throws this thing. Now you see the revolutionary reality of that passage. I know some of you were like, boy, they're getting real, um, uh, how the word is, they're getting real sarcastic. You saw that in the, in the scripture, it's like, oh yeah, that's easy. Tell me to love my neighbor. How I, and, 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 and he says, that's hard. What do you mean by that? Jesus didn't change his definition of neighbor. And, and by the way, every time it is translated in the New Testament, neighbor does not mean an ethnic group. It means the people with whom we share the planet, and it actually talks about our relationship and how we regard them. You see, a neighbor is someone who's near you, but that doesn't tell the whole story, does it now? Because if you will notice that if we, you know, our neighborhoods, how come, you know, when the neighborhood is everybody look like you, it's real easy to love everybody, you know what I'm saying? When everybody in the neighborhood believes like you, oh, my neighbors, we share sugar together. We, we go over each other's house. It's, it's a joyful time because they're our neighbors. But then let someone move in the neighborhood that wears a hijab, then somehow they're now, what you're going to do about the neighbor? Do you treat them the same way as if you treated someone who was like you? Or let someone move in the neighborhood who looks at you and says, my pronouns are they. And you say, 
I don't want to be their neighbors. Because what you mean by neighbors is that you mean that you wish for them. Not that they're like you, but they have the same quality of life that you have. They have the same abilities that you have. They are loved as if they are you. That's what a neighbor is. You know, when somebody moves in the neighborhood or, or different color or someone who have a different color and then don't let somebody leave in the neighborhood. Now, all that's deep. But don't let somebody move next to you that play the music loud. Now, that's that's too much. You know what I'm saying? Or who dog barks all night. You know what I'm saying? That's when the that's when it's a stretch, right? It's like, okay, you know, you know, they ain't acting right. I mean, you want to actually evict that neighbor because they're not like you. And we didn't take that kind of sense of neighborhood. And you notice that that is the national dialogue is what do we do when we don't all agree on everything? What do we do when there are people that are different from us? Some people's answer is try to get everybody to be like me. Hey, folks, I'm going to let you know that ain't going to work. I, I, look, I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you why it don't work. I mean, there's some deep, I can give you a deep explanation why that's going to work. But if you try to make me a white man, that ain't just not going to work. I mean, that's, you know, so and there are other conditions in life. It's not going to work. So you're going to have to deal with the other and the, it's how you deal with them. I want them to have the same life as me. That's why it is depressing, problematic, enigmatic that religious people look at folk and say, unless you have my choices, you shouldn't have my freedom. That's not what you do with neighbors. In fact, let me go one last thing. How I know we treat a neighbor different is that when we start looking at issues not from the basis of of strategies or from the basis of policy but what if we looked at an issue from the basis of what if that was your neighbor it would turn totally do different then suddenly these issues that became issues of that look so complicated are so clear because if your neighbor's 14 year old daughter was raped by someone in her household you would want her to have a choice if your neighbor was someone who was beaten up because they were different gender presenting, that's not a policy. That's a person. You would want them to live. If your neighbor was someone who came from another country and now was called to work for $15 less an hour simply because they could exploit them. Suddenly, this is not about policy or borders. This is about my neighbor. This is the challenge of scripture. Don't retreat into some scriptural challenges. You notice what the Pharisees did? They, they quoted scripture. I, I, you know, for you deep theologians, for you biblical people, here's the problem with that. If you give me a scripture on one side, I can give you a scripture on another side. You ever did, uh, see, no, see y'all, y'all got, you, you around much more nicer people than I am, but I'm around sometimes people who literally, uh, who know the word of God. And so I'll say this, they'll say that, I'll say this, they'll say that, I'll say this. And we get into this head game about what the scriptures say. But here's the revolution of Jesus. It's not only scriptures, but it's relationship with God. And only relationship with God is our relationship with humanity. Because remember, if Jesus is the son of God, and the thing that is revolutionary about Jesus is that it says that God, I, I say this so often, but I say it again and again, it is, it is not surprising that God loves us. It is surprising that God will become human for us to live among us. Because it says the importance not only of God, but the importance of the human experience. I know that sounds like heresy, but that's the very basis of the incarnation. God came to save us, not from the sense of divine retribution, but divine punishment that we do on each other. Jesus 
went to the cross not because he broke a law of humanity. He went to the cross because he was living like God was calling him to live. Do you realize that he was the criminal? And sometimes what the world says is not what God wants because it is a different way. I suggest in this season where we're looking at Christians and Christianity that we are not to be like everyone else. We are to regard and look and say, what does the word of God say? What does my connection with humanity say? And what does my, this is good, this is good reform theology. And what does my conscience say? And then I'm going to stand in that and proclaim that. And I don't care who else doesn't. And I'm going to engage with you because I love somebody enough to call them my neighbor. There was a dude who was also a Presbyterian elder. I was going to wear, if I didn't, if we didn't do today, I was going to wear a sweater. And I believe it was tennis shoes that he wore. Yes, in tennis shoes. Now, you got to be of a certain age to know where I'm going at this point. Well, he was a Presbyterian elder, and his name was Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers, he revolutionized children's ministry because he told kids, do not regard yourself in terms of a single family, but regard yourself in terms of a neighborhood. Mr. Rogers, he would look at the cameras and says, would you be my neighbor? Would you be someone that cares about me in the way that I care about you? And together in that caring, we change the neighborhood. We're struggling with that. Not only in America, but in Marin City. We're struggling with that. We used to be 80%, I believe, African Americans in the 70s, actually. We're now 20, 22%. How do you hold space for that? And continue to say together, how can we be a multicultural community? Not because of ethnicity, but how do we regard each other as neighbors? I don't want to just live next to you. I want to have a relationship with you. I want to love you. I want you to feel safe when you come home. Even if I disagree with you, even if you're loud, even if you're problematic, even if you have a different faith tradition, even if I don't really like you, I want you to have the same freedom and the same way of leaving that I do because that's what the Bible says I should do. Yes. That's what Christian understanding of what it looks like to have politics. Now, there are these great theologians that I could quote, so you know, I'm, you know I ain't this crazy guy. Okay, I'm a, maybe I'm a little crazy, but, but I just want you to know there are other people who said that. Then why isn't it so? Why isn't it so is not because people don't know it. It's because people don't believe in it and have the courage to stand. It's easy, and I'm going to be controversial here, to stand for DEI. It's easy to stand for inclusion in certain circumstances. But it's real hard when you now, I'm not gonna look at them or their ethnicity. I'm gonna look at them as my sister, my brother, my sibling. And even though they may be crazy, I won't let you then mistreat them. I'm amazed at the left and the right. I'm amazed at how we treat one another, even in political debate. I may disagree with you, but I will never, ever, ever diminish your humanity because I disagree with you. I won't feel righteous indignation because I'm standing in the right place, but I'm having the wrong relationship. This is a hard thing. This is a difficult thing. This is what needs to happen at Tam High School. This is what needs to happen at every school in the country, that if that had happened in the Georgia school, what if the child who was clearly, clearly had issues. What if instead of saying, well, I hope they work it out. <laughs> uh, well, the police talked to him. What if the community said, he's my neighbor. 
And I'm not giving up on this kid until I find out what's wrong and doing with it, because this is why I have to care. You think you can do this alone? You think that what happens to her and what happens to her and what happens to her has to have something with what will happen to you? You're wrong. This is why we do food pantry, not because we're trying to help those faux folk who don't have food or, or the homeless. It's because they are my neighbors. It's because we're connected. It's also because I am somehow responsible, not only for what happens good in their lives, but if I'm also my neighbors, I'm responsible for what might have happened badly. See that one coming, didn't you? Because if we broke it, we can fix it. If, it. if it's our policy, we can change it. If the kid has been treated badly, we can love them to be better. I know the power, it, it has too long become faith or humanity. But that's not how the Bible looks at it in the incarnation. It's in the incarnation it says that what we do matters and it matters enough to change the world if we change the relationship with those in the world. What if Marin County, we are in the seg most segregated city, not only, not only we are, the, the Marin City and Marin County are the most segregated politically, socially, and, and, and economic in the entire state of California. We're number two, actually, we're not one, but we're number two. What if we say, you know what, we can fix that. I will preach every Sunday against one thing that is the most corrosive thing, cynicism. How dare you believe you don't matter? How dare you believe your faith is not something that it just helps you get through, it doesn't help you change things? How dare you believe that all of this Holy Spirit, all of this God, all of what we say is not given to us just to get through. It's given to us to overcome. You will hear me preach and you've heard me preach. There's no movement that's changed America that started off with a good prognosis. <laughs> Literally, ask the women. They said, oh, they shouldn't have to vote. They said, oh yeah, we will. Ask African-Americans, dogs, oh yeah, they will. It's not impossible. We have to believe. I don't want to change just the politics. I want to change the relationship. When I looked at little June today, I said, wow, God, look at this. You've given us another baby in the world. And she's not here to simply live through the world but the love and the power and the personality of that little one as she grows up will change everyone around her if we allow her to change us. Who is my neighbor? It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. Would you be mine?